Thank you. May I now invite Professor Lee Hong Lam to introduce the next speaker. Professor Lee, please. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm pleased to introduce our keynote speaker, Mr. James Badenow. Mr. Badenow is a leading Queen's Council in London. He was educated at Oxford and has practiced from the beginning at the prestigious set of chambers of Mr. John Elliott at One Crown Office Row, London. He became a Queen's Council in 1989 and has appeared in a succession of major cases in the House of Lords, the Privy Council, the Court of Appeal, and the High Court. He is a leading practitioner in the field of cl clinical negligence, professional discipline, and personal injury. He is widely recognized to be, and I quote, practically the father of clinical negligence, unquote and solicitor looks his exceptional insight, especially when it comes to liability in birth injury cases. Also hailed as a brilliant courtroom barrister who deal with the most complex cases, he is said to be in, a quote, a class of his own, unquote. Re regarding publications, Mr. Badenot has contributed to Power and Harris's clinical negligence he is also the co-author of Urology and the Law. He has also published numerous articles in learned journals and periodicals. He has lectured frequently on medical, legal, and related subjects, and is a regular speaker on the TV and radio. He has addressed by invitation, among others, the Parliamentary and Scientific Committee of the House of Commons and Lords, the senior judiciary, and royal colleges. He has served as a deputy high court judge. He has, as a barrister, he has won many important legal battles for his clients. The recent case of Montgomery and Nanoshare held bought in 2015 is a landmark case on the legal duty of disclosure. Mr. Badenow is not new to Hong Kong. He has conducted legal cases in Hong Kong. His mother was born and brought up in Hong Kong, and his grandfather, Mother Sai, was a professor of education at the University of Hong Kong. Without further ado, may I in introduce, may I invite uh, Mr. Jane Badenow. Many thanks to Professor Lee for that flattering introduction, and many thanks to Shekhar Kumta and the other members of his faculty for inviting me here. I'm very honored uh, to have this invitation and to speak in your magnificent hall in this wonderful university with its beautiful campus. I um, am proud to have a, a background or history in Hong Kong from my family that you heard, and I'm particularly delighted that um, I have addressed this audience, which I gather is largely medical, but also includes a number, of, a, a number of lawyers. And also, when I was last here in April, the Hong Kong Academy of Medicine, who presented me with this tie, which I wear with pride. The decision in uh, the UK Supreme Court in Montgomery against Lanarkshire Health Board is a momentous one. It has major implications for the practice of docs and surgeons in, in the matter of disclosure of information to patients for the purpose of consent to treatment. And its momentous nature is in the fact that it overturned a long-standing and much-cited decision on consent of the Judicial Committee of the House of Lords, of which the Supreme Court is its successor, in the case of Sidaway and the Board of Governors of Bethlehem and Morsley Hospital. Sidaway is a case to which I'll be referring a number of times. That case and the decision in Sidaway in 1985 had been the subject of whole chapters in textbooks and much criticism by lawyers and academics in the whole of the world which follows the English legal system. 
what Sidaway decided was that the so-called Bolan principle would apply in all areas of clinical practice to whatever a doctor was engaged upon, being a principle of the liability of doctors in negligence, which was established in the famous case of Bolam against Free and Barnet Hospital Management Committee in 1957. And Bolam is a case, the name of which has resounded down the history of the English legal world in relation to medical matters. And I will be describing to you shortly uh, the facts of Bolam, which led to the establishment of a principle in his name as the plaintiff in a case which he lost and therefore was no doubt unhappy to give his name to the principle which made him lose it. The decision of the Supreme Court in Montgomery, put shortly, was that in respect of the alleged negligence in the adequacy of disclosure by a doctor for the purpose of obtaining patient consent, the Bolam principle will no longer apply, though it will still and does still in relation to matters of diagnosis and treatment, the other aspects of medical care which are unfortunately with increasing frequency the subject of litigation. By the so-called Bolam test, the issue of whether or not the doctor was negligent is determined solely by the answer to this question. Was what the doctor did or did not do sanctioned as adequate and acceptable by a responsible body of the medical profession, even if a minority one, and even if a very small minority? If such a body could be found, that would sanction what the doctor did or didn't do as acceptable, it is, under the Bolan principle, a complete and total answer to any allegation of negligence. It need hardly be said that in respect of consent or disclosure for consent, there has always been found a very wide range of idiosyncratic views among the medical profession about how much it is right or how much it's necessary to tell the patient before seeking their consent. And the variety of these views you may readily accept has led to very great uncertainty about the supposed legal rights of patients because the small minority of doctors may strongly espouse the telling of almost nothing, for example, to the patient uh, and others in the medical field have for a long time espoused the view expressed so well and so clearly by our speakers already today that the best course for a doctor is to make a, a reasonably full disclosure to the patient before seeking his consent. And yet the Sidaway case, the ruling which said that Bolam applies to disclosure for consent, prevailed for many, many years, for over 30 years in our legal system. The legal system which is followed here and essentially followed in many of the English-speaking countries and others of the world as, I hope, a reasonably good legacy of Britain's otherwise uh, somewhat tarnished colonial history. The Sidaway proposition that Bolam applies effectively enshrined in law the persistence of a paternalistic and patronizing approach which has been taken historically by many doctors, which was endorsed and approved expressly in the Sidaway decision, in particular by Lord Diplock, a judge of the old school to whose opinions I confess I don't readily turn for enlightenment on any subject at all. The decision in, in Montgomery was the culmination of a long, slow, but quite marked development of the law in other jurisdictions which follow the English law, and which had, I have to tell you, left the English courts and the English cases well behind. So in my submission to the Supreme Court and to you, the ruling in Montgomery was well overdue. Now, by that decision, Montgomery, directly following the lead given in other jurisdictions, the Bolam test is no longer to apply in consent cases. It is no longer a defense to a doctor to say, well, I didn't tell the patient anything, or I didn't tell the patient much, but the fact is, here is a minority, perhaps, body of medical opinion that approves my doing it in that way, and therefore I have a defense, no longer in relation to consent cases. What Montgomery has done is replace that test, the Bolan principle, by what's called the patient-centered test. Did the doctor take reasonable care to ensure that the patient was made aware before consenting of any material risks or of any reasonable alternative or variant treatments? And the test of materiality is whether in the circumstances of the particular case a reasonable person in that patient's position would be likely to attach significance to the risk or that the doctor is or should reasonably be aware that the particular patient would be likely to attach significance to it. 
to that duty there will be, uh, after Montgomery and still uh, according to Montgomery, some well-defined exceptions. The so-called therapeutic privilege is one of them, the first, by which the doctor may withhold or limit information he gives to the patient on, on reasonable grounds, if they exist, that disclosure to this particular patient would harm the patient's health, physical or mental. And there may be patients of extreme sensitivity, uh, perhaps particularly those with mental problems, in respect of whom that therapeutic privilege may reasonably apply. Secondly, in cases of necessity, that is to say where treatment is essential in the immediate interests of the patient's life or safety, but the patient is unconscious or otherwise incapable of understanding. And thirdly, possibly also, or perhaps presumably, where the patient, him or herself, has expressed the considered wish not to learn, not to be told about the risks or uncertainty of outcome in his treatment. And we all know there'll be patients who say, look, doc, you're the doctor, it's up to you. Don't, don't, I don't want to hear about all the risks you can, you can tell me about. I leave it to you, I put myself in your hands. And if the patient expressly does that, it will be an exception, in my opinion, to the rule in Montgomery. Ethicists and many pe people who work in the law in this field, and indeed many uh, uh, in the medical and surgical professions, will welcome the ruling in Montgomery. But of course, there are many still who oppose it or resent it. There are doctors who still cling doggedly to the arguments which were put forward and dispensed with in Montgomery by the Supreme Court. For example, that unreasonable difficulties are presented for doctors in deciding what information is material, according to the new test, and the claim that the generality of patients can't be expected to understand scientific concepts, may only achieve an imperfect grasp of the significance of potential risks or perceived benefits, and may make foolish decisions based on irrelevancies and on misunderstandings of what the doctor has so patiently tried to explain. Such arguments insist that judicious rationing of information is the best way for doctors to avoid, uh, to beg your pardon, to avoid refusal of consent and to secure necessary consent to necessary treatment. Those arguments were dismissed by the Supreme Court in Montgomery. Were they right? In my opinion, yes, they were right to dismiss them. And a brief study of the shift in public and societal attitudes to medicine and to patients' role in the world serves to confirm my opinion that it's been the right answer in Montgomery. May I briefly discuss and tell you about the facts in the Montgomery case? I think they'll disturb and astonish you, both for the extremity of those facts and for the extraordinary nature of the defense. A case which, in my opinion, and indeed in the Supreme Court's opinion when they came to give judgment, should never have been defended at all, led by reason of that foolish defense on the part of the lawyers to the overturning of a principle upon which their own clients, the defense lawyers, would have been happy to rely perhaps for many years to come had they not chosen to defend this case, which led, of course, to it ending up in the Supreme Court. Mrs. Montgomery was an intelligent graduate in molecular biology. She was pregnant with her first pregnancy and was of very small stature. In European terms, five foot, five foot one-ish was her height, and in European terms, that is very small. She was a long-standing insulin-dependent diabetic, and uh, that condition, as many of you will know, has the unfortunate uh, habit of leading in pregnant women with the disease to the overgrowth, excessive fetal growth in the womb, known as macrosomia. And macrosomia in such women is equally oddly, in my estimation, associated strangely with particular overgrowth in the deposits of fat around the fetal shoulders. And there is a particular risk in a baby with ab a fetus with abnormally large shoulders. That risk may occur in a laboring mother in such circumstances, namely that when the fetal head is delivered, the aftercoming shoulders can get stuck behind the mother's symphysis pubis, a condition or an obstetric emergency known as shoulder dystocia and it occurs in the labor of about 10% of diabetic mothers. It requires sometimes extreme measures to overcome it, which themselves can cause injury to the baby and indeed to the mother. But worst of all, there is the likelihood, if it remains unrelieved, of fetal asphyxia from the trapped or occluded umbilical cord so that delay can mean brain damage or death for the baby. And that will occur in about one or maximally 2% of the cases where shoulder dystocia is encountered 
though which cases they will be in any given pregnancy cannot, of course, be predicted in advance. For this reason, the, Dr. McClellan, the obstetrician, arranged for serial and frequent ultrasound measurements, indeed fortnightly, which is rare, but was because the baby was growing excessively. She further admitted that the mother was very anxious about the size of her baby relative to her own small stature, and frequently asked whether she'd be able to deliver vaginally in the normal way such a big baby. And Dr. McLennan told, chose, deliberately as she said, to withhold from the mother any information at all about the risks that in fact that mother ran in laboring and delivering vaginally. She did so, said Dr. McLennan, because she wished to allow her, her words, to labor naturally and in order to reassure her that if problems, as she said, I told her, arose during her labor, we could simply go to cesarean section. A reassurance which is misleading at best and entirely false at worst. Because, of course, once shoulder dystocia has in fact occurred, the head is out, the shoulders are stuck. That is the terrible major obstetric emergency which was faced in this case, the risk which this mother, the doctor, knew ran. But once it occurs, it's too late to go to cesarean section. In fact, it is the fact that most obstetricians in the developed world would not only offer cesarean section to mothers in this woman's situation, but would in fact advise it. It does appear that McClellan's readiness to ignore all these dangers and deliberately withhold any mention of the risk of shoulder dystocia to Mrs. Montgomery derived in large measure from the fact that she'd never ever encountered it herself, a fact which enabled her to say in evidence before the court that shoulder dystocia is, as she put it, often overcome with the mother unaware that it has happened. An assertion which to any obstetrician who has encountered it would be truly astonishing. As soon as it occurs, a whole lot of things happen very dramatically and suddenly in that uh, delivery suite. The room will fill with pediatricians, anesthetists, extra midwives, any other obstetricians that happen to be available. The mother will be pulled to the edge of the couch. Her knees will be forced back onto her chest. Measures will be taken to try and ease the shoulder out from under her symphysis pubis, which, of which she cannot be unaware, uh, obviously can't be unaware. And then if it cannot be released, uh, desperate measures will follow to try and relieve the baby and get it out. So uh, what happened here? Well, not only was the mother not told of the risks, it was quite clear that she was terrified. That's why they kept on measuring her uh, baby's size. The doctor even said, I withheld the last measurement before her due date because that might frighten her even more. It was perfectly obvious, as she said herself, that she longed to be given a cesarean section and would have jumped at it if offered. Well, the dreadful events occurred. The baby's head was delivered. After, by the way, the, the, the labor was induced even in this mother. It became obstructed in this mother and yet they didn't go to cesarean section when it was obviously obstructed. Instead, they forced the augmentation of the labor with the contractions by the use of the drug syntocinon to force that baby down the birth canal. And so they succeeded. They forced the baby down, the head emerged, and the shoulders stuck. The ensuing scenes were horrific. The McRoberts maneuver, the one I've just described, was carried out. Mother pulled to the edge of the couch. It failed. The doctor, the obstetrician McLennan, then attempted something truly horrific. She tried to cut right through the mother's symphysis pubis, uh, which is apparently in the third world the alternative to cesarean section if they can't carry one out. She hadn't got the right instrument, so she only managed to cut about halfway through and then gave up and then said that she used forceps and with, as she put it, I think, superhuman effort, she managed to pull the baby out. By that time, the worst possible things have occurred. One, the baby had suffered uh, uh, brachial plexus lesion, the nerves from the, uh, governing the function of the arm uh, of the baby had been avulsed from the spinal cord and the baby now has a completely flail, useless and sensationless arm. But worst of all, he was by now terribly asphyxiated and is grossly and catastrophically disabled. And that resulting disability led, not unnaturally and not surprisingly, to litigation by his young parents who have his lifetime of care almost I think 24 hours a day. The odd thing was that in the ensuing litigation in Scotland, the defense uh, defended to the hilt. 
They argued that it was the amount of information given, namely almost none at all, was perfectly reasonable, that there was a Bolam defense and even managed to find obstetricians and called them to agree as an allegedly responsible body of opinion that withholding information from this mother was perfectly reasonable, despite the fact that in, even in the Sidaway case, an exception was made to the rule that doctors needn't disclose anything which their brethren don't think it necessary to disclose, was given namely that if the patient asks specific questions, said Sidaway, then in that circumstance you must answer truthfully. Uh, they said that the mother's are, uh, questions, will I be able to deliver this big baby normally and naturally, or will the baby suffer harm or will I suffer harm? They said they weren't questions about risk, they were merely, as they put it in the defense, expressions of generalized anxiety. You may ask yourself what other more specific question about the very risk she ran could have been asked by this mother other than, will I be able to get this baby out normally without harm? But that's their defense, and they took this defense all the way. Unnecessary to tell anything to this mother, and when she asked questions, they were just generalized anxiety. Amazingly, the Scottish judge at the trial accepted those arguments, dismissed the claim, endorsed the doctor's approach. So, uh, uh, and very discreditably, in my opinion, did the Scottish Appeal Court, three judges, who all agreed with those astonishing propositions and said that was perfectly right in English law, according to Sidaway, applying that Bolam test. Well, let's briefly talk about Bolam. Hector Bolam was very depressed. Uh, he was given electric shock treatment, ECT, which was, in those days, popular, went out of favor, and I believe has now come back for the treatment of intractable depression. Uh, paddles are applied to the head, and large electric shocks are given. And naturally enough, one of the problems with the shocks is they can cause muscular spasm in the patient. For that reason, uh, he suffered his injuries. He was given electric shocks. He went into such spasm that they hurled him bodily off his couch onto the hard floor where he suffered bilateral fractures, I think of the femurs, and was crippled for life. He went to court and said they should have restrained him by straps or belts on the couch before giving the shocks, or they should have sedated him. And what happened very simply in that case was uh, the distinguished psychiatrist called to give evidence for Mr. Bolam said, of course we should strap him down and sedate him because of the risks of these spasms, exactly as occurred. But uh, uh, surprisingly, you may think, the defense found psychiatrists, oh, no, 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 the risks of strapping the man down and sedating him are also very real, and we wouldn't approve of doing it, and we don't do it. So said the judge in that case, in his direction to the jury, the famous Bolam direction. A doctor is not guilty of negligence if he's acted in accordance with the practice accepted as proper by a responsible body of medical men skilled in the particular art. Putting it the other way around, a doctor is not negligent if he's acting in accordance with such a practice merely because there is a body of opinion which takes a contrary view. And so was established in Bolam the principle on which he lost his case and which prevailed for many years and it's been expressed in other cases quite simply. A case in, called Maynard had this in it. A case, said the judge, which is based on an allegation that a fully considered decision of two consultants in the field of their special skill was negligent, clearly prevents certain difficulties of proof. It is not enough to show there is a body of competent professional opinion which considers that theirs was a wrong decision. If there also exists a body of professional opinion equally competent, which supports the decision as reasonable in all the circumstances. And in another passage from Sidaway, the dissenting judge in Sidaway, Lord Scarman, whose opinion has now finally prevailed in Montgomery, but which was overruled by the majority of the judges in that case of Sidaway, he uh, 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 said about the Bolam test or described the Bolam test in this way. A judge's preference for one body of distinguished professional opinion to another, also professionally distinguished, is not sufficient to establish negligence in a practitioner whose actions have received the seal of approval of those whose opinions truthfully expressed, honestly held, were not preferred. In the realm of diagnosis and treatment, negligence is not established by preferring one respectable body of professional opinion to another. That system, that principle, applied historically to medicine, was not applied to other professions, although there is a theory that it should have 
Some academics think it's of general application to all professions. But there is an interesting case in Hong Kong called Edward Wong Finance against Johnson, Stokes and Master in 1984, which is very instructive. The English court, the House of Lords, ended up dealing with that case when it came finally to its final appeal. Now, of course, in, the, in Hong Kong, you have your own court of final appeal, but historically it was the English House of Lords Judicial Committee, the, the law lords, as they were known. Uh, the firm of solicitors in that case, Johnson, Stokes and Master, had adopted a, an almost universal method of conveyancing of property. Almost every solicitor in Hong Kong used the same method. It had a loophole in it which allowed fraud, and in this case, the plaintiff had suffered fraud as a result of the way in which the conveyancing was done, albeit it was done in accordance with the almost universal method adopted in Hong Kong. So, said the defendants, it can't possibly be negligent of us to use it because all of us, or nearly all of us, use it. And the evidence was quite clear that that was true. Not so, said the House of Lords, where there's an obvious risk, which the system which all of you, almost all of you adopt, an obvious risk of harm to the client, then it is negligent to use it despite the huge majority of solicitors who adhered to it. And so that principle in the case of legal negligence was not applied, but in doctors, including in relation to disclosure for consent, it has prevailed for all those years from the 50s right through till Montgomery, the decision of which was handed down in the early part of this year. Well, Bolam has been, in my experience in the law, a dangerous principle. It's led, in my view, to much injustice. May I briefly summarize a case of mine which is scarred on my soul. The obstetrician who delivered my client's baby uh, was in the process of conducting a cesarean section. He lifted the baby's body out by its legs, and before the head came out, the uterus went into spasm, clamping round the baby's neck, trapping the baby's after-coming head within the uterus. Of course, the baby is now asphyxiating. There is a very simple way to solve this rare but known complication. The original incision is horizontal. Cut a quick vertical incision, making a total of a T. Cut a quick vertical incision, thus opening up the uterus from spasm breaking through the muscular fibers, and out will come the baby's head instantly, saving it from all danger. No, the obstetrician didn't do it. He waited and waited for what he knew would eventually happen, namely release of the spasm. And eventually it did happen, by which time the baby's brain was irrevocably and catastrophically damaged. I may say that I had thought that that case should be won, but the defense, to my astonishment, called two professors from Guy's Hospital, who said that to cut that T incision would be an unacceptable mutilation of the uterus and pointed to a phrase of that extent in a textbook called McGillivray, an old textbook. And they also said that that cut would threaten the mother's future fertility. Now remember she had a live, viable, perfectly normal, fully grown baby that was about to be delivered. But they said they mustn't save that baby because the way of doing it suggested would threaten her future fertility. The judge swallowed it. The judge said that's a complete Bolam defense, and the case was lost, and I should have appealed it. I was young. The Bolam was in its pomp and its supremacy, and I didn't. And if I had, I'm quite sure that the, uh, the House of Lords, where we'd have ended up eventually, the Judicial Committee, the Law Lords, would have said that that defense, albeit a true Bolam defense, did not withstand logical analysis. And had they done so, the proviso to that effect, that a, even a, a valid Bolam defense body of medical opinion must withstand logical analysis, the Belitho proviso, in the case of Belitho much later decided, would have been brought in much sooner had I appealed that case of the uterine spasm. And I will go to my grave wishing that I had, not only for justice for that child, which was terribly damaged, but also in the interests of the advancing the law. Could I just say this, that in Sidaway, when the law lords applied Bolam to consent, Lord Diplock had said that the giving of information, the deciding of what risks the patient faced uh, and about which the patient should be warned and the terms of that warning and whether there's need for any such warning, he said, Lord Diplock, was as much a part of the doctor's special skill and judgment 
as the other parts of his function in diagnosis and treatment. And he also said in Sid away, Lord Diplock, that the only effect that mention of risk could have on a patient's mind, if it has any effect at all, was his wording, strangely, would be in the direction of deterring the patient from undergoing treatment, which in the expert opinion of the doctor, it was in his interest to undergo. Oddly, that condescending approach by Lord Diplock has prevailed for all these years until now. The paternalistic and patronizing approach, which in effect, as has been argued, amounted to a kind of medical tyranny. I know best, I shall tell you what I choose to tell you, and if I tell you too much, it'll only frighten you, my dear fellow. You can't possibly understand it. I know best. It shows and assumes in the patient, is what I argued in Montgomery, and I guess that most of you agree. That approach assumes in the patient a lack of capacity for rational thought, a rational and independent thought, I should say, unquestioning subservience to the doctor's superior status, and an abject surrender of personal autonomy. But interestingly, Lord Diplock made a special exception, as he put it, for people such as himself. He said that people like me, judges with a highly educated brain and much training, would expect to be told everything, so that we, as he put it, could make up our own... My, I'll, I'll read out his words, as a matter of fact. Uh, the kind of training experience that a judge will have undergone at the bar makes it natural for him to say correctly, it is my right to decide whether any particular thing is done to my body. And I want to be fully informed of any risks there may be involved, of which I'm not already aware from my general knowledge as a highly educated man of experience, so that I may form my own judgment as to whether to refuse the advised treatment or not. So there it was. For himself and others of this small minority like him, the doctor should tell him everything. But for the great majority, all the rest of us, no, no, the doctor should not have to tell him any more than doctors generally think is reasonable to tell a patient. And of course, you will have seen that the essential fallacy in all this, in the Sidaway principle and in the way it was expressed, is the equation by the law of the doctor's decisions about treatment and diagnosis, which of course are the doctor's decisions to make. What is wrong with the patient? What shall we do about it? Equating those decisions with the other type of decision, which is consent, which after all is the patient's decision to make, and the patient's alone, whether to submit to treatment or any alternative, or indeed the patient's perfect right to refuse treatment altogether. And that is our right. Patient autonomy, so vividly and eloquently described by our speakers that have gone before me. Patient autonomy, which you, <laughs> here we are, intelligent, educated people, I am sure agree is our right. And historically, it, it proceeds from the proposition that we have autonomy over our own bodies. And indeed, it is the case that until not all that long ago, the submission of a patient to either drug therapy or surgical therapy by a, a doctor, the invasion of his body by one means or another without his consent, was indeed actually treated by the law as an assault until that was overruled as inappropriate. But the fact is, uh, as the American judge in 1914 said it, Justice Court Cardozo, every human being of adult years and sound mind has a right to determine what shall be done with his own body. Well, doctor knows best is the contrary view. Leave it to me is the contrary view. And that is an attitude which has been deeply ingrained in the past, not only in the medical profession, but I would say in the populations at large. Accepting that doctor knows best was no doubt partly due to the historically prevailing culture of subservience to those in authority, or possessed of greater learning, and in part to generalized ignorance and even awe of the wondrous science of medicine and consequent deference to its supposedly heroic practitioners. That awe was founded, it seems to me, on a fatalistic acceptance of the cruelty of disease and its often inexorable course, and on the associated belief born of that ignorance that doctors practice a quasi-magical art which is not for mere mortals to understand or to question. And those kind of beliefs do still persist to this day, but mainly, I would suggest, in the older sections of our populations. It was that idea 
that was embodied in the Bolam appli application of the Bolam test to consent. Well, let me just turn, if I may, to the essence of the problem which Montgomery addressed. I've suggested that the real kernel of it is this. Diagnosis and treatment are decisions of the doctor based on his special skill and knowledge. Consent is the patient's own, patient's own decision and nobody else's. And in the case of uh, Rogers and Whitaker in Australia in 1993, a very simple problem arose. A woman was blind in one eye. She was at middle aged, raised her family, and was going back to teaching. She wanted some improvement to the cosmetic appearance of her blind eye. Uh, she went to a surgeon. He said, yes, I can make it look a bit better for you. Uh, she asked, in fact, is there any risk? Is there any risk? He said, no, no, no. He told her there was no risk. There was, in fact, a risk. The risk was a very small one indeed, one in 14,000 of sympathetic ophthalmia. You and I would be horrified to know that means that in operating on the blind eye, there was a risk that the good eye, the only remaining sighted eye, would also become blind. He denied her the knowledge, he denied her the information, he operated and the worst possible thing happened, she became blind altogether. And uh, surgeon after surgeon gave evidence in defense of the, that surgeon, saying, we wouldn't dream of telling a patient of a 1 in 14,000 risk. Rubbish, said the judges of Australia in much politer terms than that. Uh, what they said is that the patient has indeed his own choice whether to consent or not. And they put it this way. The choice is in reality meaningless unless it is made on the basis of relevant information and advice because the choice to be made calls for a decision by the patient on information known to the medical practitioner but not to the patient. It would be illogical to hold that the amount of information to be provided by the medical practitioner can be determined from the perspective of the practitioner alone or for that matter from the perspective of the medical profession. And that, you may think, was obviously right. It caused such a flutter in the dovecots in Australia uh, that in some states, uh, although that case dismissed Bolam from the field of consent and in fact went further and proposed that Bolam should be removed also as the definitive and ultimate defense in all other forms of medical alleged negligence, some states have, uh, by legislation, res resumed the application of Bolam by, by a modified version of it by legislation which says that it shall be defense if what the doctor did is sanctioned and approved by a substantial body of medical opinion. I hasten to add to you this. I would never have quarreled with that proposition because if it is indeed a substantial body of opinion that sanctions what was done, it would be very difficult, wouldn't it, for a judge to say they're all wrong and I overrule them and find them unreasonable. What's wrong with the Bolam test? is that it allows even a very small minority, a maverick minority of the profession to present a total defense to a claim of negligence on the basis of saying, well, we approve it, even if most doctors don't. And that has always seemed to me to be wrong. And the irony of the decision in Montgomery, the irony is this, that it belatedly, in fact, brought the law into line with the British General Medical Council's propositions and guidelines about information disclosure for consent, which has long been to this effect. And I read out from GMC publications, which were published long ago. Give the patients the information they want or need in the way they can understand. Respect the patient's right to reach a decision with you about their treatment and care. Listen to and respond to their concerns and preferences. The doctor in another publication, the GMC, puts it this way. The doctor explains the options to the patient, setting out the potential benefits, risks, burdens, and side effects of each option, including the option to have no treatment. The doctor may recommend a particular option which they believe to be best for the patient, but they must not put pressure on the patient to accept their advice. The patient weighs up the potential benefits, risks, and burdens of the various options, as well as any non-clinical issues which are relevant to them. The patient decides whether to accept any of the options, and if so, which one. And another passage from the GMC guidance long since given, before Montgomery was decided. A doctor must tell patients if treatment might result in serious adverse outcome, 
even if the risks are very small, and should also tell patients about less serious complications if they occur frequently. Could I just quickly um, mention a couple of cases which perhaps illustrate uh, the problems and the importance of these issues? Um, I was involved in a case of a woman who gave birth in a midwife-only unit. A series of mistakes had led to this. She was a woman with some long-standing medical concerns of a relatively minor nature. Uh, the midwives had wanted to deliver this woman, it was her first child, in a midwife-only unit. But because of the health concerns, they referred her to a consultant obstetrician to make that decision. Uh, they didn't give the mother any information about the midwife-only unit. And when she got in front of the obstetrician, nor did he. He examined her, he listened to her history and said, your health is not a cause for concern, you're low risk, and I, ass I, will, ass I will assign you to the midwife-only unit. He thought that all he was being asked to do was confirm that she was safe to go to the midwife-only unit. The obstetricians thought, or the midwives who'd sent her there thought, that the doctor would discuss with her and explain the information necessary, including giving a leaflet which existed about the situation in the midwife-only unit. So nobody gave her the information, nobody discussed the risks with her, and they were as follows. The midwife-only unit was considerable distance from a hospital. There was no operating theater there, no anesthetist, no obstetrician, no opportunity for epidural, no opportunity for rescuing a stuck baby with forceps or von twos. None of this information was given to the mother. And she was uh, consigned to the midwife-only unit. Of course, the worst happened. The baby got obstructed. They couldn't get the baby out. They called an ambulance. The weather was bad. It was late at night. The ambulance finally got there and was directed to the wrong part of the midwife-only unit. When they finally found the mother, they took a long time to lay, load this laboring mother in great pain into their ambulance. In the bad weather, the ambulance journey took a considerable time. Uh, she gave birth in the ambulance. The baby was blue. They phoned ahead and tried to resuscitate the baby by stopping by the roadside. You've guessed it. By the end of it, the baby was horrendously damaged in its brain. And the case was defended on paper. It was defended almost to the door of the court. But you may agree with me, this was before Montgomery was decided, that that mother made no kind of informed consent at all to be delivered in the midwife-only unit. You may share with me some concerns about the existence of such units at some distance from a hospital. After all, although childbirth is normal, although childbirth is natural, although childbirth is in almost all circumstances a happy and healthy situation and, and a process, I mean, there are, as we all know, rare but terrible cases when things go awfully wrong. She should have been warned. She should have been asked whether she consented to delivering there. She wasn't. Had that case been contested ultimately in the court, I'm sure we'd have ended up, if it had been found in favor of the defendants, we'd have ended up with a Montgomery appeal going to the Supreme Court. But we had to wait uh, longer for the right case and the right facts to turn up, which was the Montgomery case. The other interesting case which I'd like to quickly tell you about of mine was a case called Birch against Uni University College Hospitals Trust, Health Trust in London, very famous hospital, UCH. This lady was a long-standing insulin-dependent diabetic and she had a history of diabetic retinopathy. She presented at the local hospital with a vascular third nerve palsy. The overwhelming likelihood was that she had a, it was painful and pupil sparing. The overwhelming likelihood was that this was yet another self-limiting instance of a, a diabetic uh, problem with the vascularity of the eye. She'd had this before, and it resolves without treatment. Indeed, the advice in such cases at Moorfields Eye Hospital, with her and with many others, has been watch and wait and make sure that it does resolve. Uh, the consultant who saw her at the local hospital wanted an MRI uh, angiography. Uh, because he was just a little concerned that this third, this vascular, this third nerve palsy might betray some more serious pathology in the uh, cavernous sinus or in the, in the brain. Uh, they couldn't do MRI at that hospital at the weekend, so she was sent to the National Hospital for Neurology and Neurosurgery, the famous hospital in Queen Square in London. There she was meant to be in the physician's ward, but unfortunately for her, she fell among the surgeons. The, neuro <laughs> the neurosurgeons suffered from what I think is known as a selection bias, 
By the time most patients end up at their tertiary referral center with symptoms like Mrs. Birch, they've ended up there because they've been through a series of filters and are thought seriously and on good grounds, possibly to have aneurysm or, or cavernous sinus pathology. And the surgeons in that instance, knowing they may have to operate, like to have the best possible map of all that's going on. And therefore, they proposed, indeed, they made no offer of anything else, CT angiography with the invasive procedure of the catheter uh, inserted in the groin and pushed all the way up and the uh, imaging done in that way. The invasion of her body carried a risk. MRI, as you all know, is non-invasive with no risk at all of stroke but the CT angiography carried a small, very small risk, but real one of stroke. She submitted herself, because they gave her no option, to the CT angiography with the catheterization, and of course she suffered a stroke, was paralyzed down one half of her body, and the end of her, uh, the twilight years of her life, she was recently retired and looking forward to a happy retirement, traveling, gardening with her husband, was utterly blighted. They defended it to the hilt, they said, we were making the right choice in the circumstances. We were entitled to make the right choice, and she cannot, should not complain. And the case was defended all the way through to trial. We won the case on one simple principle. MRI was the first offer she'd received. The surgeons may very well have had perfectly good reason in their own minds to want CT angiography, but it carried a real risk a real risk which in the particular facts of her case it was not essential to take, provided she had full information. She should have been told that she had the alternative modality of MRI angiography, which would be non-invasive and which in, in fact carried no risk at all. And the judge held, and it was not appealed, that she should have been told of that alternative and given the opportunity to choose it, which she said, and everyone I fa found her entirely credible, she would have rapidly accepted the non-invasive alternative because she'd had these symptoms before and they'd resolved without treatment. So this very distinguished, world-famous hospital was condemned in negligence for not offering her and explaining to her the facts, the alternatives, and the facts about them. So the question that Montgomery asked and answered was this. Who ultimately sets the standard of care for doctors in relation to information and consent? Is it still to be the profession itself with its idiosyncratic views, which vary from doctor to doctor, some of whom believe you should tell the patient nothing because all it does is frighten and confuse them, others of whom believe, as we've heard from these excellent practitioners today, that a better and wiser and fuller information is the best course, or should it be the law, which after all sets the standard of care and defines whether it's been breached in all other areas of human endeavor which may affect our fellow man? And Montgomery answers that in relation to information and consent, it should be the law, that Bolam will no longer hold sway, and that the right answer is that the patient needs and deserves and must receive full information both about the risks and outcomes and about alternatives, if any, and their comparative risks and outcomes before being asked to consent. And in another case, a judge put it very simply in this way. I approach the case on the basis that a clinician must take reasonable care to give a warning which is adequate in scope, content, and presentation, and take steps to see that the warning is understood. So that's a simple expression of the principle which now applies to information and consent. Could I just quickly, I hope, I, I know I'm getting a, a bit late, but I think I would, if I may, like to just discuss the practical effects of Montgomery on the practice of doctors and surgeons. I, I think that we should approach it in the following way. One, the pro forma approach to consent, that bit of formal paper, which you simply say, read this and sign it, must be abandoned. I don't mean to say the form has to be thrown away, but just sticking it in front of the patient and saying, sign here if you agree, is not enough. Two, the signature on a consent form proves nothing except that the patient can write his own name. 
Three, there must be genuine dialogue between doctor and patient. Merely rehearsing or reading out a pre-drafted or standard wording won't do. Patients are different. Patients' risks are different. Patient, doctor's experience in his own hands of outcomes is different. Four, when discussing risks and benefits and alternatives, uh, the doctor must, one, and these are my advices, but I hope that they are right insofar as the law is concerned and I'm not proved wrong, when discussing risks, benefits, and alternatives, the doctor must, one, be sure to use words the patient can readily understand and check that there is real understanding. Two, avoid overloading the patient with excessively detailed information. Keep it simple. Three, so far as possible, avoid technical jargon, using it only where there is no other way of describing what is proposed. Four, tailor the discussion to the patient, which means, A, and I've had to go to little letters now, a, first consider what are the risks of the proposed treatment about which a reasonable patient in this patient's position would need and want to know. That is the objective test. B, next consider the particular patient and his or her individual characteristics and his or her situation in life, e.g. age, intellectual ability, nature and demands of employment, if any, family and other responsibilities, social and other problems, prospects if untreated, etc. And that is the subjective test, this particular patient. C, personalize the issue so as to identify with this particular patient in the given, what this particular patient in this particular situation would be expected to need and to want to know and add to or modify the disclosure accordingly. Now I've read out a lot of stuff which I've drafted but I hope you agree that most of this is just good-hearted common sense. Uh, I have, in fact, the opportunity, I might send it through to, um, to Shekhar. Shekhar. Uh, I've put this in, into printed form and I could easily send it through, so if anyone would like to have a printed version of this short summary, I'm very happy and we'll send it later today so it can be available to anyone who wants it. I've gone now to the fifth principle or proposition. If a doctor is expressly told by the patient or has clear and compelling reasons to believe that the patient is unwilling or unable to face disclosure of chances, risks, and uncertainties of outcome, the doctor, A, should first decide whether there is nevertheless a compelling need to disclose a risk, i.e., or e.g., a known complication which could result in serious harm, however small the risk might be, the, the, the withholding of which might vitiate consent. B, the doctor may, absent such a compelling need, accept the patient's wish not to be told and limit disclosure accordingly. But C, should in such cases make a very careful note of the matter and of the reason why he has acted, the doctor has acted as he has. Point six, sensitivity to the characteristics of patients is expressly required by Montgomery, so that by way of example, discussion of the risks of labor with a nervous first-time mother might be very different from the same discussion with a mother who has previously labored and given birth to other children. Seven, statistics relating to risk are not a decisive measure of whether it requires to be disclosed. A small risk of serious consequences, if well recognized, may be expected to be of significance to most patients, and particularly significant to a patient undergoing a non-urgent, strictly unnecessary or purely cosmetic treatment. A large risk of very minor or transient side effects, such as are listed interminably in the data sheets which accompany your prescription drugs, will usually not require disclosure. Eight, a specific risk, however small, may be of particular significance to patients whose lives or livelihoods would be especially affected if the risk materialized. For example, a case of damage to the voice for a singer or the failure rate of sterilization for a mother who already has too many children to cope with and too little money to pay for them. The case of Hatcher and Black, an old, old case, exemplified the worst of medical tyranny. A woman who worked for the BBC, whose voice was her fortune and her livelihood, was having an operation on a nodule or whatever in her throat. Uh, 
the doctor was asked by the woman were there any risks to her voice, and he deliberately lied because he didn't want to frighten her um, about the operation. He said, no, no risks at all. There was indeed a serious risk to her voice, and the risk materialized. The doctor defended himself and said, I lied because I thought it was the best thing to do. And Lord Denning, then not Lord Denning, but an ordinary judge before his elevation, directed the jury, he did not, that doctor did not criticize the offending practitioner, nor should we, thus approving the telling of that deliberate lie. Well, you and I will all agree nowadays that if the patient has specific features of a case which mean that even a very small risk is highly relevant to their case, it should be disclosed. Point nine, a doctor who is not good at communicating with patients, and I'm afraid there are some, whether because they're inexpert or unwilling, must recognize that fact and must take steps to acquire the rest relevant skills. Point 10, lack of time for adequate dialogue with the patient may seem an ever-present and even insuperable problem. Indeed, that is the main complaint I've been hearing in the UK about the Montgomery decision from doctors. We don't have time. We have so little time, we're under such pressure. I'm afraid that time constraints will have to be overcome because what's at issue is the patient's most basic and fundamental right, namely to decide what shall or shall not be done with his own body and of which alternatives, if there are any, he wants to accept. 11, it will often not be reasonable to delegate disclosure of information for consent, although if you do so, you must make sure as a doctor that the person you delegate it to is sufficiently informed and sufficiently trained in the matters which, ma which are of concern. So delegation is not impermissible, but you must make sure if you're a senior doctor that the delegatee is up to the job. 12, the standard required in respect of disclosure is a reasonable one, not perfection. And this means that in all ordinary circumstances, one, or would you like little a, a huge catalog of extremely remote risks of the kind find in drug data sheets can and almost always should be avoided. The test of reasonableness will recognize good sense in this regard. Two, in giving information and seeking consent, the doctor may, in the right circumstances, and it's been discussed earlier this morning, may, no doubt will in some cases, express his own view of what he would choose in, if he were in the patient's shoes or what he would wish for his children, for example. He must do so with care because he will know how persuasive such an expression will be. And as Shekhar Kumta said this morning, <laughs> he may be asked what his own um, decision would be when he has himself undergone the very procedure in question and not had a very happy outcome. But there again, perhaps frankness, the department of utter candor with the patient would be valuable. Point 13, sensitive and frank disclosure in advance of risks and benefits, including acknowledgement of any real uncertainties about successful outcome, may be expected to engender less anger, less bewilderment, less recrimination in the patient if and when things don't turn out well. Thus, 14, as the GMC asserted in the case of Montgomery when they intervened through their lawyers, and as the Supreme Court agreed, information which displaces ignorance will make it less likely that the patient will have recourse to lawyers because he won't think that the bad outcome must be the result of bad performance. He will understand because the doctor has put him in the picture before the whole thing was undertaken. So could I just end, and I'm sorry I've taken a bit too long, by stressing what is the important thing for anxious doctors and surgeons to remember. The key to all this is going to be, is already and will be reasonableness. The standard of disclosure will only be what is reasonable in all the circumstances of the case. You must take account as a doctor of the seriousness of the patient's condition, the degree or extent of the need for the relevant treatment, the gravity to this patient of any small risk and the need for good sense about listing minute and very rare risks and side effects or complications, which in most cases will be quite unnecessary. And above all, as members of your profession, the medical profession, 
I think my best advice would be take the time, even if it's a swift note, to make a careful note of the disclosure you've made and the patient's response. I thank you for your attention, and I'm sorry if I've taken too much of your time. <laughs>